Hello and welcome to a new episode of Siblings. Imagine in a planetary system there is an intelligent race on one planet. The closest planet, which is just on the edge of the habitable zone around the star, has about the same size, therefore the same gravity. It also has a dense atmosphere. At one time in the past it was probably in the habitable zone, so you could learn a lot about what might have been a fascinating past. One would think that it would be a lucky circumstance and the intelligent beings would send lots of probes and rovers there. There would be plans to colonize it and they would soon have a second homeworld. But they sent most of their rovers and probes to the planet on the other side. With a thin atmosphere, lower gravity and plan to colonize that one. We live in this planetary system. What went wrong? Everything went wrong with our neighboring planet. This week let us look at the second planet in our solar system. It seems to be within reach. It is the brightest natural object in Earth's night sky, after the moon. So bright it can even cast shadows. It is a commonly misreported UFO. Sometimes it is even visible to the naked eye in broad daylight. Seen from Earth it is never more than 47 degrees from the sun, so it can be best seen either setting in the west, just after dusk, or rising in the east a little while before dawn. It has been a major inspiration for writers and poets as the morning star and the evening star. Many cultures, like the ancient Egyptians and Greeks, really thought the planet was two separate bodies. It was probably the first planet that mankind took notes of over 4000 years ago. In Sumerian religion, Inanna, goddess of fertility and beauty, was associated with it. Later the ancient Greeks associated it with Aphrodite, goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, passion and procreation. They used the name Phosphorus, meaning light bringer, and Hesperos, meaning western one, for its two forms. The Romans translated that as Lucifer, which just means light bringer, but is not connected to the devil, and Vesper. But they realized soon it was one and the same object moving across the sky. The goddess they associated it with was Venus, also a goddess of love, beauty, fertility, prosperity and victory. The astronomical symbol for Venus is a circle with a small equal armed cross beneath it, the same as used in biology for indicating the female gender. Later Galileo Galilei discovered with telescopes that Venus showed phases like the moon. And observed when it is furthest from the sun, it shows a half-lit phase. When it is closest, it shows a crescent or a full phase, which would only be possible if it orbited the sun. One of the first observations that clearly contradicted the Earth being the center of the solar system. Later we found out much more about the planet next to us, being 108 million kilometers away from the sun. It has a diameter of 12,104 kilometers, only 638 kilometers less than Earth and a mass of 81.5 of Earth's. Nowhere in the solar system will you find gravity more like Earth. It goes around the Sun in 225 days, a bit faster than Earth, but its rotation is strange. It takes 243 Earth days, longer than a Venusian year, to rotate once around its axis. That means a day on Venus is a bit longer than a year. Also it rotates in the opposite direction. The Sun rises in the west and sets in the east, like something just turned the planet around and its north pole points in the opposite direction of Earth's. It rotates so slowly if you stood at the equator you could keep it daytime forever by just walking. Probably Venus has been hit by something planet-sized one time, like the impact on Earth in its early days. The result of Earth's collision was its moon. The result of the collision with Venus might have been that it was left upside down with a terribly slow rotation. All a matter of mass and angle of impact. Also Venus does not have any moon now. Something that can be important for stabilizing the axis of a planet. Venus is so bright because it is shrouded in clouds that reflect about 90% of the sunlight. We just could not see the surface at the beginning of research. On rare occasions Venus passes in front of the sun, a so called Venus transit. A lot of things recently changed on earth in the times in between them. 1874, the event was recorded in the oldest known film. 1882 it did another transit. 
Then it took until 2004 and 2012. If you missed that, just wait until December 11th, 2117. Let's hope there won't be clouds. As we found out more about this planet over time, people began dreaming of what might be under the clouds of Venus. Between 1930 and 1950, we knew some things about our neighbor, but too little as no space probe ever reached another planet yet. So there was an endless series of science fiction pondering about jungles with alien creatures that might live next to us. Not unlike Pandora in Avatar, but soon we should find out about how wrong we had been. After the Soviet Union put the first satellite around Earth and the first man in space before the race to the moon, there was also a kind of race to get data from other planets. And we learned getting to them is not easy. There were lots of failures. While the Soviet Union had ongoing attempts in 1961, the US succeeded in performing a flyby in 1962. With Mariner 2, Venus became the first planet beyond Earth visited by a spacecraft. It passed 35,000 kilometers above the surface. 1967, the Soviet Venera 4 successfully entered the atmosphere and deployed science experiments. In the same year, the US had a successful flyby with Mariner 5. Although there was an ongoing Cold War between the nations, the data was analyzed by a combined Soviet-American science team. Slowly we found out that Venus seems to be overall extremely hot, which was a surprise as even on Mercury, the closest planet to the Sun, there can be regions with water ice where the Sun does not shine. With the Soviet mission Venera 7 in 1970, the first man-made spacecraft successfully landed on another planet and transmitted data for 20 minutes. And it was shocking. Under clouds of sulfuric acid, there was an atmosphere of 96% CO2 with temperatures about 464 degrees Celsius, enough to melt lead. Under an atmospheric pressure, 92 times the one at sea level on Earth, which is about the same as 900 meters below the surface of the ocean, which makes the atmosphere technically a supercritical fluid. All hopes of manned mission and similarity to Earth seemed to be lost. In the 1970s, the now collapsed Arecibo Observatory also revealed details of the surface for the first time, using pulses of radio waves looking through the clouds. It showed two highly reflective regions, then called Alpha and Beta regions, also a region attributed to mountains, which was called Maxwell Montes. These three features are now the only ones on Venus that do not have female names. All other surface features since then were named after historical and mythological women. 1974, Mariner 10 made a flyby and took ultraviolet photographs of the clouds, revealing the extraordinarily high wind speeds in the upper atmosphere. 1975, the Soviet Venera 9 and 10 landers transmitted the first black and white images from the surface of another planet. They lasted about an hour. Although Venus is a bit closer to the Sun than we are, it receives less sunlight on the ground, due to the reflective clouds that might rain down sulfuric acid. 1982, the first color images followed, with Venera 13 lasting 2 hours and Venera 14 lasting 1. The successful Soviet Venera program ended in 1983, with Venera 15 and 16 orbiting Venus. 1985, the Soviet Union, in cooperation with other countries, performed a final program called Vega. That might be interesting regarding future Venus exploration and maybe colonization. They successfully managed to float probes attached to balloons through the upper atmosphere. They were coated with substances protecting against the acidic corrosion and lasted over 46 hours. With the US probe Magellan in 1990, the surface of Venus was finally mapped completely via radar instruments looking through the clouds. It also found a reflective substance at the top of the highest mountain peaks, like snow, which is certainly not the case. Until now there are guesses about the type of substance. 2006, Venus Express by the European Space Agency entered the orbit of Venus and found out a lot about the planet, including active volcanism. Right now, during the making of this video, early 2021, except flybys by space probes with uh, different destinations, 
There is just a Japanese probe in an orbit around Venus since 2015. And there are a lot of plans for future missions by several countries. So what else did we find out about this hellish twin of Earth? What made this thick CO2 layer beneath the acidic clouds? The main reason for its baking temperature all over the planet is a runaway greenhouse effect. Some substances in the atmosphere like water vapor and carbon dioxide act like a blanket that traps the energy of solar radiation. Venus might have had water oceans in the past until 700 million years ago. Its atmosphere might have been not unlike Earth's. The hotter it got, the more water evaporated, which accelerated the process. The hydrogen has been swept into interplanetary space by solar wind and left a dry desert with unbound CO2 all over the planet. Until it got so hot that even the rocks were outgassing CO2, which even increased the greenhouse effect. Venus also lacks a protective magnetic field like Earth. The weak one it got is probably due to the interaction of the solar wind with the atmosphere. Venus seems to lack internal convection like Earth or plate tectonics, which could also have helped binding CO2 back to the planet. Venus has several times as many volcanoes as Earth, and it has 167 large volcanoes that are over 100 kilometers across. This is not because Venus is more volcanically active, but the fact that the result of volcanic activity can be seen longer, because its crust is older. Earth's crust is continually recycled by subduction of tectonic plates, and it has an average age of about 100 million years. But the Venusian surface is estimated to be 300 to 600 million years old. Back then it underwent a global resurfacing event. A recurring process in which the mantle temperatures rise like in a pressure cooker until they reach a critical level that weakens the crust. Then over a period of about 100 million years subduction occurs on an enormous scale, completely recycling the crust. The whole planet erupted. Besides known forms of volcanoes, there are also stranger types, like flat-topped volcanic features called phara, which look like pancakes and range in size from 20 to 50 kilometers and from 100 to 1000 meters high. Also radial star-like fracture systems called nobe, and features with both radial and concentric fractures, resembling spider webs known as arachnoids, as well as coronae, circular rings of fractures sometimes surrounded by depression. Besides volcanic features, there are also almost a thousand impact craters on Venus, perfectly preserved, but no craters smaller than three kilometers. Because due to the dense atmosphere, objects less than 50 meters in diameter will burn up. The northern continent or elevation is called Ishtar Terra, after Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of love, and is about the size of Australia. On it, the Maxwell Montes, highest ones on Venus, with a peak of 11 kilometers, higher than Mount Everest. The southern continent is called Aphrodite Terra, at roughly the size of South America. A network of fractures and faults covers most of its area. Imagine how large the surface area is by picturing Earth without its oceans. Of course, you could not walk around a lot, even if you built spacesuits that could withstand the heat and pressure, even if the winds on the surface are only a few kilometers per hour. Because of the high density of the atmosphere, they can even transport small stones. Think about standing in flowing water. Also, sending robotic rovers there is no option, as electronics will not last exceptionally long. Plans have been proposed for rovers controlled by a mechanical computer and driven by wind power. Currently some approaches are being tested by putting mechanical clocks into ovens. But somewhere in the upper cloud layers of Venus, although there can be winds up to 300 km per hour, there must be a zone with the atmospheric pressure of Earth and about that temperature. Only the environment is acidic. Therefore, there are proposals for floating cities to make a human presence possible. The challenge would be to keep it in place and protect it against the acid. But due to the same pressure inside and outside, it is less prone to explosive decompression as on other planets. Maybe something already lives in that regions. 
carbon dioxide and sunlight, which are necessary for photosynthesis, are already there. From time to time there are headlines, like 2020 with the discovery of phosphine in the clouds of Venus. Something that could be an indicator for microorganisms floating around. Yet it turned out as so often as a false alarm when doing more research. Anyway, we must do more research to understand Venus as good as we can. For two reasons. One is that we can better understand climate change on Earth. The other one is that we are constantly finding new Earth-sized planets around other stars. And we must be able to estimate if they could harbor life. So maybe in the end it is incredibly lucky that we are faced with a planet that one could call Earth's crazy sister. Next week we will talk about the planet that we know a lot about. Still, it is so complex and special that we certainly do not understand it completely. If you watched until here, I guess you are a fan of space and this series, please consider supporting me on Patreon. It would help me out a lot and keep the channel going. Because I'm more than 1415 and the real world is incredible. <laughs>